You see, I'm something of a magician, inventor, and chocolate maker. So quiet up and listen down. Nope, scratch that. Reverse it. Congratulations on the movie. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Thank Seen you, it four Nikki. times already. One thing that wow. as four sure, times. Four times. I mean, yes. One thing that is as sure as sugar. You, Timothy, every film that I've seen you in, you have such a natural way on camera where you don't see the acting. Thank you. Very understated, very natural. Very few actors can do that. Mm. This was the total opposite. It uh -huh. required something very different of you. Yes. Singing, dancing, something more outwards. Mm -hmm. What was that adjustment like for you in Coming Wonka? Yeah, it was a tonal adjustment because um, the movies I've been in, even something like Dune that's 8,000 years in the future, they have a very naturalistic quality. And this was very much like old school storytelling, sort of like golden age of, mm -hmm. of musical, MGM musical, as you put it before. So that was a shift, you know, um, and uh, sort of like a stamina uh, adjustment to always be on, you know. Um, because the character, as opposed to Willy Wonka in the Tim Burton version and the Gene Wilder version, who's sort of intaking what's what's going on. I think in the Gene Wilder version, he shows up maybe 30, 45 minutes into, into the movie. The movie yeah. This is really like the, Willy Wonka's the, uh, he's propelling his own story here. Because it's, it's a different story. Uh, so it was a new challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Let, it, let all your inhibitions have to go in a sense, Absolutely. Right? So which sort of felt like, um, even when I remember seeing uh, Daniel Day-Lewis at a Lincoln Q&A in high school, and he said, uh, how important failure is letting go. And uh, that always stuck with me because he's probably the goat. He is the and, goat. Yeah. And uh, so definitely having to let go of inhibitions here. And then I shouted, do a sequel. And it, was like, it was the greatest. I'm going to shout that to you at the end yeah, of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do a sequel. Yeah, that, was, that was the greatest. Oh, oh that was one of my top <laughs> high school moments. Oh, my gosh. That's that do a sequel that was one of my best. to Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. Well, from goats to gods, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but Timothy called you an athletic comedy god. <laughs> Did you, you call those did exact you words? <laughs> oh my yes. goodness. So I want to know from you because this you've done theater, you've done obviously you have your comedy roots. I want to know for you this was almost like a balance in a sense, mm -hmm, right? Like mm -hmm. sketch comedy because there was so much there's like one shot of you through a keyhole where I'm like the facial expression alone, comedy god. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Creating this cop, I want to know how you did that. First of all, uh, to be quite honest, a lot of it was done for me through that amazing hair and makeup team and the amazing wardrobe team. They, they were unbelievable. They, 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 they were like half of it. So they were pu I was putting the character on. It was a lot. It was very outside in, mm. and um, there was some inside out elements as well, like the dialect. So I, I got to really hide in a character, which was really fun. I, I don't always get to do that. Sometimes it's just, you know, sometimes you're in a movie and it's just, it's just a version of you. Whereas mm -hmm. here I felt that wow. I, got to, I got to really hide in, inside of something and that, and that was what propelled the character forward. I love that. It was really great. It was so much fun. Through the whole movie, in my brain, the first time I watched it, I was like, please sing Pure Imagination. Uh -huh. Please sing it, please sing it. I'm wondering for you, what was the process of recording that? Like it was, mm -hmm. it was different than the other songs. The other songs were really pre-recorded at Abbey Road, which was a trip in and of itself. The beginning half of Pure Imagination was live, you know, uh, which was a huge help because, uh, you know, uh, J James Taylor, our musical supervisor, he was there with the piano and I had a little earpiece that was playing, it, but there was no rhythm I had to stay within. In fact, I don't know how they'll do it on the on the soundtrack or whatever, but it's not. It wasn't in rhythm when I did it. He has to come with me, and then. You know, it could take the beats necessary, seeing Noodle oh, walk away. Interesting. And be, you know, um, I totally butchered it there, but uh, that was the that was the scariest one to tackle. But then the rest of it, when he's no spoilers, once he's yeah. gallivanting with the Oompa Loompa, that was all pre-recorded. In the role that he was born to play, by the way. I know. In the role he was born to play. Um, I talked to Paul, and Paul uh -huh. told me, because I said, you've left a lot of room in between, because it's 25 years between right. the end of this film and the next one. And he told me he wants to take you so dark in the next one. Would that be interesting to you? Obviously, you're not doing a sequel. You're not confirming you're doing a sequel, but yeah. do you think that would be interesting to I play think that part of Wonka? I think something happens, and you know, the sort of family and friend screenings we, we've had or that, that Keegan has set up, that's my favorite sort of... Um, kind of conclusion from this movie because I had that thought too finishing the script because he's such a joyful character and we don't really get the seeds of his you know you lose Charlie like that 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 quality so something happens I'm curious about it I don't I don't know if Paul knows Paul King knows but uh what happened to this young, mm, young yeah. man that you know curdles his spirit would that be something you would want to do yeah I'd be so curious what that yeah. story is it could be anything it could be anything it could, yeah it could go in so many different directions yeah yeah, yeah. I have something real quick for you Ooh. because mm -hmm. I've heard you in other interviews. I've watched every interview uh -huh. you guys have done for this. Uh -huh. 
What is your favorite chocolate? <gasps> My favorite chocolate? That's yeah. a huge gift. Cadbury's fruit That's nut. crazy. Maybe. I'm That's Canadian. Crazy. Are you kidding I me, Nick? I am Canadian. Nikki? And because if you have a nut because allergy, you know. nut yeah. allergies, no, I don't. No, no, no. I brought one for you, too, so Amazing. you can try it. Oh, my God. That's, I mean, uh, you got me a fruit wow. nut. I got your fruit nut. By the way, wow. you can buy them in the United States. I don't live there anymore. So You can, uh, you can get them here. You can get them here. But I wanted you to know and wow. have it because I heard you talking about it. Thank so. you. That's so great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Every good thing in this world started with a dream. So you hold on to yours. Here we go, Mama. This is such a wonderful film, and I, I think we all will go into this film with the outside world, sort of the influences, positive, negative. And I know the exact moment where I completely abandoned myself and gave over to the joy of this film because there's not a cynical bone in this film's body. So I'm wondering for you, you've also made these wonderful Paddington movies. What is it about you that you want to make movies of pure joy and, and just complete innocence? Because you're, you're taking a Wonka story and you've made it something totally new. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, for me, the, uh, I, I love going into, to, to, when I watch a movie, to get, to feel like I've fallen into another world or another place. And it's a great opportunity in that dark room just to feel the troubles of the world melt away and go, go into a different place. So something that can transport you, especially a family movie, I think, which you might be seeing with parents or grandparents or kids. And uh, to have to go on a journey together is just the most special thing. You make movies that are so positive. I mean, I love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and and and, and obviously the the Willy Wonka meet in that is very you're not quite sure who he is, and he's very enigmatic and a bit sort of unknowable. And then at the end, there's this moment where you realise uh, that he's. The whole purpose is to give his life's work away to a child. And it's this extraordinary act of kindness and generosity. And that's why I'm a blubbering wreck when I watch, you know, watch the movie or read the book. And when I read it again as a grown up, I was in pieces in a way. I think as a kid, I responded to the vivid colors and the umpalumpas and all the kind of the bells and whistles. But there's such a strong heart at the, the, uh, to it. And uh, for me, that's the, the best sort of movie. Hugh Grant. This is the role he was born to play. Forget Notting Hill. Yes, this is. He's finally found something he's he can do. Finally found. <laughs> but this is my favorite role he has ever done. Oh, good. Yes. Good. I want to know though. Obviously, he's not Oompa Loompa size. I no. want to know on the day because you were the person there on the day. Yes. And you know what all that looked like because he sort of alluded to the fact that there were dots on his head and what did Hugh Grant. What was his performance like before it was put into the film? What did it look like? Well, he was on set with Timothy. So he obviously, was. yeah. So he's obviously not 18 inches high, which is the <laughs> one drawback. He's so funny and he's so good at being sort of sarcastic and, and sort of mean curmudgeonly sort of figure. And when I was reading the, 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 the poems in the book, I just kept having his voice in my head. And then once you've imagined him this high with, you know, orange skin and green hair. You, there's no getting it out of your head. It traumatizes you. It's a deeply traumatic image. I can imagine there was a lot left on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah. You have you made with Paddington probably the greatest sequel of all time. <laughs> and I know you're not going to answer pitch. whether or not you <laughs> planned on making a sequel, but I feel like there's so much room between the 25 years and where we leave off. Is it something you would like to do? And if so, yeah. have you already sort of mapped it out in your head? We really wanted to make a movie with a beginning, middle and end, because I find it yeah. so frustrating when you've sat in a cinema for two hours and then they go, we'll see you next year. And you go, ah, that wasn't the deal <laughs> I made coming in. And uh, it's so uh, hopefully our movie does that and works on its own terms. Yeah. But we also didn't want to take him all the way to the chocolate factory in this kind of slightly broken, strange soul, because it didn't feel like that would be a particularly happy end to a movie. And uh, so there's there's loads of material in that Dahl wrote and in the in the books and the movies of like things that happened to him in the middle. So I think absolutely there could be a sequel, but it relies on many millions of people <laughs> seeing the movie. So fingers crossed. Yeah. You could change her life, Mr. Walker. Change all their lives. I've watched this movie four times already. I love it oh, so much. You guys look amazing. Thank you. You are amazing in the film. I'm going to start with you, Kayla. Um, I've, I haven't heard you talk about how you got cast. Like, how long a process was this? Was it a Timothy Chalamet chemistry read? Was that involved? I actually never auditioned with anybody from the cast. I never did. I only I did a director session with the director. But um, I did four auditions, including a screen test. And I think 
by like the third audition is when I actually realized it was for Willy Wonka. So I, I got like, I did two auditions, just regular self tapes, cause this was during COVID, I think. Yeah, it was during COVID. Yeah. And then um, I was at um, Universal Studios when I realized that I was going to England to do a screen test for the movie. And so I got there, did the screen test and all that. And I got to sing and dance and, um, and act and do different scenes on set. But then after that, I um, met Timmy on Zoom. And he was filming another, another movie during that time. So I met him on Zoom and we talked. And then, and then I got the movie. <laughs> um, that, was, um, that was in my room with my mom. And we were sitting in there and wow. the director called me himself and he was like, so I think that, I mean, like I would love for you to come back to England and all that stuff. And then I was like, so does this mean we come back for another <laughs> screen test or something? And he was like, no, you got the part. And we just screamed to the top of my lungs oh, and all of that. Gosh. <laughs> well, this is, and this is kind of for the both of you, but I feel like there has to be a point when you film this movie where you just have to turn yourself over and abandon yourself because there's a lot of performances where you have to be smaller or you have to be more contained. I'm thinking of your character from White Lotus. She was very contained and mm -hmm. wanted to burst. But can you talk about the actual process of filming those musical numbers and how... How much do you sort of have to just like be not self-conscious and just let mm -hmm. it all go? Well, I think 100% of like any actor's approach is to lose yourself in the character, but what helped with this particular film more than most, it's the realistic sets. I mean, when you walked on set, it was a city that they had built. And so there's nothing that can make you forget about, you know, your, you know, actor's apartment and like, you know, the, your emails, then walking into a world from a different time. And it really allows you to escape into that, you know, that the space and the character. Yeah, because I know the moment, and I told Paul this, the moment in this film where I, I abandoned myself. Like you forgot about everything that you were thinking about before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I kept thinking to myself as I was watching a couple of your scenes, you must have been on wires at some point. Yes, I was on <laughs> yes. wires. I was on wires. I was on wires when I was um, on top of the ladder. Yeah, and I was also on wires when we were doing the big balloon, balloon scene, balloon and we flew up scene. into the to the air. But most of that was done in green screen. Yeah, but there was one scene at the very end when we're like coming down at the end, and we then we start dancing. That was real. We were like at least sixty feet high in the air, and we like came all the way down, and then we had to start dancing on wires and all of that. Yeah. Wild. Wow. It was fun though. It was so, what, so fun. What was for each of you the moment where you would say, this was my most joyous moment on set? Oh my goodness. We had so much fun. The Scrub It yeah. and Bleacher Gang. Um, that song stuck in my head. Scrub, <laughs> scrub, scrub. scrub. Uh, it stuck in my head until 2024. <laughs> That's where uh, we have a text message thread called Scrub, Scrub. <laughs> But it was just so fun. I mean, I just remember we were waiting in between takes and all the actors were there and Olivia Coleman had us playing this like word game and oh. it was just the people. Like for me, yeah. it's not just one moment. It was just being around some just amazing people that understood what we were trying to accomplish. What was your favorite song to sing? Ooh. To sing like in the film or just to sing in general? <laughs> like, Well, you can do both. Yeah, I mean like, <laughs> um, I feel like A World of Your Own is probably my favorite song in the whole film. I mean like, it's at the peak of when he gets his shop and all of that and he's enjoying himself. So yeah, that's probably my favorite song and I got to sing at that, in that, just a little bit at the end. <laughs> Real quick, who's more evil, Mrs. Scrubbit or Jennifer Coolidge's character from White Oh Lives? boy. <laughs> I think they have to be first cousins. <laughs> DNA, it's in the DNA, but they're both beautifully, wonderfully evil. <laughs> and so not like that in real. No, exactly. That's why it's amazing. Yeah. It's their antithetical, yeah.